Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the EKG case for the week of April 29th, 2013. This week's case is sent to us by Dr. Yen Chow, who is from Thunder Bay, Ontario. What a totally cool name for a place to be from. I would love to be from someplace called Thunder Bay. Anyway, Dr. Chow, I, I happened to kind of meet through the internet. Uh, well, no, it's not what you're thinking. I met him through Twitter. He's uh, fairly active on Twitter, and I saw that he, uh, he had posted some interesting cases on Twitter, and so I contacted him, and he was kind enough to share this case with me and with all of us. So this was a patient that he took care of. 80-year-old man came into the emergency department complaining of a 30-minute episode of chest pain. Now, by the time the patient arrived, he was feeling a lot better, and he reported a one-month history of progressive exertional shortness of breath. Now, 80 years old, with practically any cardiopulmonary complaints, you've got to really worry, and you're going to get an EKG, of course. Uh, and here is the initial 12-lead EKG. Now, the computer would probably, I don't know what the computer interpretation here was, but my guess is that the computer interpretation, most computers that I know of, would call this just nonspecific ST abnormalities. And the reason is, if you look at all of these leads, there's some very minor ST segment changes. You know, if you look out here in lead two, uh, you know, they'd probably call it nonspecific, just a little bit of elevation in lead three, but it's not elevation in contiguous leads, little depression in lead two, a little depression in, uh, what else, maybe a little in AVL in one, maybe just a tiny bit, you'd have to imagine that, you know what, let's forget that, but at least a little depression there in V3 and V4 and V5 and V6. And the reason I say that computers are gonna call this nonspecific is because most EKG computers are programmed to only read a full millimeter of ST segment change as significant. If the ST segment change is less than one millimeter, computers have a tendency to call it nonspecific. But nonspecific should not be reassuring because a person can sure enough have some major disease with only mild ST segment changes, less than a millimeter. And so you really need to be very, very uh, careful about that. In fact, if we take this 12 lead EKG and we blow it up, just blowing up a couple of leads, you can perhaps appreciate the ST segment changes a little bit better. And by the way, in the United States, at least in this hor horrendous medical legal system, what I've come to uh, understand is that if you end up in court for a litigation for a missed EKG or some subtle EKG, what they'll oftentimes tend to do is the plaintiff attorneys will take that 12 lead EKG and blow it up just the way I'm showing you here. And when you blow these leads up in front of a jury, for example, well, suddenly that tiny bit of ST segment change can become very, very obvious to a lay jury. They'll look at that and say, how in the world did you miss that ST segment depression? Even, even non-physicians, a lay jury can pick up the ST segment changes that this, uh, this person missed. So again, uh, looking in really all of these leads, there's just a tiny, tiny bit of ST segment change. And when you blow it up, you can really appreciate it. The computer will not appreciate it. And, uh, and oftentimes when you're working really quickly, you may not appreciate it, but you got to take a really, really close look. Anyway, we, we got an, we get an old EKG on this patient. There's the baseline and you clearly see that those mild ST segment changes were not there before. Everything looks pretty normal. There's no ST segment depression anywhere. And, uh, Maybe that tiny, tiny bit of ST segment elevation is still there in lead three, but the rest of the ST segment depressions are not there. Well, Dr. Chow was not going to be fooled by this, and he decided to go ahead and get a repeat uh, EKG, and largely that's because of uh, teaching by a very famous emergency physician in Nashville that I've quoted before at Vanderbilt, the chairman of the emergency department, Dr. Corey Slovis, who one of the most important things that I've learned from him is his concept that one EKG begets another. In other words, when in doubt, in fact, not even when in doubt, he'll just say, when you get one EKG, it should lead you to get another one. And well, I would say that I would agree with that, certainly in somebody who's got any symptoms or if there's any concerns. Dr. Chow, remember that he went ahead and got a repeat 12 lead EKG, and now those changes on the repeat 12 lead EKG are, 
Well, they're not subtle anymore, are they? Even your 12 lead EKG is going to pick this up. There's big time ST depression in a handful of leads, and there's also ST segment elevation in lead AVR, more ST depression uh, out here in the limb leads. But what I really want to focus your attention on and what Dr. Chow was very concerned about was the ST elevation in lead AVR, which is greater than the ST elevation in V1. In fact, there is no elevation in V1. One of the things that we've been taught before, we've talked about this on the EKG video series before, is that when you have ST segment elevation in lead AVR, in the presence of ST depression in multiple other leads, you need to worry about left main coronary artery occlusion, or you may need to worry about proximal LAD, or you may also need to worry about uh, triple vessel disease. So elevation in AVR usually means one of these three things. We know that if there's elevation in AVR that's greater than the elevation in V1, it tends to narrow more to the left main coronary artery, which is a really, really bad place to have a big lesion. In fact, you know, if, if you have lesions in any of these areas, left main, proximal LAD, or triple vessel involvement, all of those are really bad. But again, the worst of those three is when you've got elevation to AVR that's greater than in V1, then you're looking at left main coronary artery occlusion with a fairly high specificity. There are some exceptions, but with a fairly high specificity. And that's what Dr. Chow was concerned about. So what he did was uh, he sent off some labs. The initial troponin was already elevated. He admitted the patient. The patient's symptoms were much improved, perhaps even resolved. Plan for urgent cath on this patient. And to no surprise, the urgent cath showed significant left main coronary artery occlusion and also multivessel involvement as well. 70 to 80% lesions in the first diagonal, the proximal left circumflex, the distal left circumflex, and the mid RCA. This guy has significant multivessel involvement, and so no surprise, he ended up going for cardiac bypass surgery. So, very, very simple and very important take home points that we can make from this case. Number one, please remember that ST segment changes can be very significant even when your computer is calling them non-significant. Computers have a tendency to call things non-significant when the ST changes are less than a millimeter, but you sure as heck can have significant disease or be having a transmural MI with ST changes that are less than one millimeter uh, in, in elevation or depression. Number two, remember Corey's rule. One EKG begets another, or my rule, I just like to say, get serial EKGs. Whenever you have any doubt, whenever you see these so-called non-specific changes, whenever you've got an unremarkable EKG, but the patient is still having pain, get a second, get a third EKG. Remember, an EKG is nothing more than just a piece of paper and ink. It's the cheapest test we've got in the emergency department, and yet it gives you life-saving information. What's the problem with just getting one or two more EKGs whenever you have any doubt or the patient's having some persistent symptoms? And then the final take-home point here, beware ST elevation in lead AVR. AVR usually gets no respect. I've oftentimes referred to ST, I've oftentimes referred to AVR as the Rodney Dangerfield lead because it gets no respect, paying homage to the famous comedian Rodney Dangerfield, who used to always say that he gets no respect. Well, lead AVR gets no respect, but I hope you respect lead AVR, because when there's ST elevation in AVR in the setting of a person with symptoms, you've got to really, really worry about left main disease or triple vessel disease or proximal LAD disease. Now, before we're done, I just want to give you a teaser for next week. I mentioned that there are some normal variants when you can have ST elevation in lead AVR, and oftentimes this is forgotten. People have a tendency now to overcall left main occlusion because they're focusing on lead AVR. So next week, we're going to talk about a little bit more about left main occlusions in lead AVR, and we're going to talk about some of the mimics or some of the normal variants, perhaps, is a better term. For example, if you take a look at this 12-lead EKG, this is pretty concerning, right? There's huge elevation in AVR, greater than the ST elevation in V1. There's ST depression and flip T waves in a whole bunch of other leads. And what I'm going to tell you is 
this EKG is a normal variant. This is not a left main coronary artery occlusion. And if you don't know why, stick around and take a listen to the video next week. So just again, a little teaser for next week. I uh, hope you guys pay attention um, and tune in next week. We'll talk about that. My thanks to Dr. Chow for sending a great case. It gave us a chance to talk about some really important information. And remember, EKGs save lives. Get good at EKGs and you will save lives. With that, we'll sign off for this week. And I look forward to talking to all of you next week. Bye for now.